الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا أدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد أبته ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا أيها الأخوة أقوى أبرار المسلسة في الإسلام وسيكم جميعا لتقوا الله عز وجل في هذا الزمان ويباج يوار Started with myself first and foremost with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these times and defeat. Fasad the Zaman during the time of corrupt times, times of corruption. Hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we will continue what we started and dealing with the section of the remedy of living during corrupt times, times which are detrimental. And first and foremost, when we say corrupt times, it's just not talking about Fasad al Zaman, it's not talking just about the chaos that is um, spreading, or the violence, or the crimes, or the. These are a part of that Fasad al Zaman. All right? It's a part of the corrupt times. But when we think of the corrupt times, the main thing you should think of is the times wherein the deen, the practicing of the deen is difficult. The times wherein the practice of righteousness, the commanding the good, prohibiting the evil, these things are difficult. During these times, which we know as Fasad uh, al these are the times which Ibn Al-Qayyim is talking about He's talking about times wherein righteousness is not at the top. Times wherein doing good, being good, and promoting good, encouraging good, isn't something that is prevalent. All right? Where wickedness is at the forefront. This is the times where we're talking about, you know, facet of zemin. So we reached up, alhamdulillah, some of the benefits of or the remedies as we call them that a person can do during the time of Fasad al in the first video. So we reached up to some of those benefits. If you remember, we, we, uh, he mentioned the reward that is attached or associated to whoever practiced the deen with him or during these times, then their reward is like what the Prophet says, Al Ibadah to fil Harak can hijrati ilayh that worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the time of these difficulties, during the time of these corrupt times, it's like making hijra to me. So one of the rewards is like an individual is making hijra. But the Prophet ﷺ said, al ibadah. So that means any act of ibadah during the times of corrupted times is considered a hijra, an actual hijra and not something that is pretentious or false. It's a real hijra. Therefore, Every time you and I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these corrupt times, that's the hijra that we are performing to the Prophet Sallallahu All right? So that's already tremendous because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us many um, examples about hijra, all right? And the status and the virtues and the father of hijra, like the famous hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he said on the member, I submit to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yaqul. Indeed, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Inna mal a'amalu bin niyat. The actions are judged by intentions. And each person will get that which he or she intended. And whosoever made his migration or his immigration, meaning made hijra to Allah and his messenger, then his hijra is for Allah and his messenger. And whoever made hijra, you know, for a worldly purpose, such as marriage, you know, such as business, tijara, any worldly purpose, or to marry a woman, then his migration is toward, towards that which he migrated for. And this hadith is collected by both Bukhari and Muslim. But we know that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the hijra here. And we know that the hijra is something that is tremendous. As the Prophet ﷺ said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح. 
there is no hijrah after the conquest, meaning the hijrah from Medina to Mecca. However, the hijrah, yeah, I mean to the hijrah from Darul Kufr to Darul Islam, that still remains. And then the other types of hijrah, as we mentioned before, Ibn Qayyim talks about the two types of hijrah that need to be made on a more spiritual ground, and that's the hijrah to Allah or hijrah to Ilah Rahman. And then the Hijrah ila Sunnah in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Hijrah that you make to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, yani Al Rahman, the Most Merciful, and the Hijrah that you make, yani to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how do you make the Hijrah to Allah by sincerity? And we talked about that in another video. I still have to finish that, inshallah. But I'm just trying to give you an understanding that the Hijrah brothers and sisters have a tremendous status. So do not look at it like it's tremendous. Also, along with that is the reward of 50 of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. You and I cannot surpass the companions unless, unless in certain narrations where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned like the reward that can be done when he says that, yes, they will be um, my brothers. And they say, Ya Rasulullah, we are brothers. We're here with you. He said, no, but they will believe in me having not seen me. Right? They will follow me, having not been around me, and so forth. So these will be my brothers. Convey this to my brothers. However, still the companions with one of Allah and hold a special ground. Allah said about them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are pleased with him, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. Right? And we know we can't get that tasqiyah. So the reward is tremendous. So just think of the reward during these times of difficulties. This is what Ibn Qayyim is trying to show us to encourage us to keep going, keep being persistent, to remain patient. All right. And another of the remedies is to remain patient during these difficult times. Tayyip. So he says, Hada wa kamil hijrat lahum bima lahum. Okay. So who's lahum here? Who is the domir? Who is the pronoun here? He's saying day. Right. He says this talking about what? What can mean? How many migrations would have been for them? Yeah, I mean, the pronoun here goes back to the companions. For the companions, they would have many migrations. And the hijrah, according to what the Messenger said, and he says, and you also, for you, there will be abundance of hijrah migrations also. Says, every legislative issue that you carry out during the times of difficulties, during the times of corruption, is as if you're making migration to the Prophet. And he says, How many of those who have migrated and made hijrah and they have strove, striven and fought with their wealth and with their lives in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's talking about the companions there here he's talking about the companions may Allah be pleased with them how many of them have actually went out and strove as Allah talks about them in Surah the Tawbah Allah talks about them in many of the stories in the Quran in Surah the Anfal Allah talks about them in Surah the Hashr Allah talks about them in many different stories in Surah the Hadith Allah talks about them in Surah Muhammad. Allah talks about them in Surah Al-Hujurat. About the companions with one Allah Ta'ala And we need to be mindful of this, of many of the things they did, so that we can, inshallah Ta'ala, follow in their footsteps. Ibn Al-Qayyim, he continues, he says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَى مِسْدَاقُهُ فِي تِرْمَذِكِّ لِمَنْ لَهُ أُدُنَانِ وَاعِيَتَانِ في أجل محي سنة ما تدفى ذاك مع الرسول رفيق بجنانهم. So in this two lines of poetry, he says, indeed the confirmation of this have come in a text reported by a Tirmidhi in his Sunan, and he says this is going to be before whosoever have two ears that what that are open to receiving the ammunition. Okay, those who hear this narration, those who wants to retain it, they didn't just heard of it. No, it actually affected them. They actually took it. Why are you attaining? Fi ajri concerning the reward of the one who muhya sunnatin, who brings a love, one who brings a love or revive a sunnah 
that seems to have been forgotten. A abandoned sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ matat, a sunnah that died. That meaning, in other words, it was forgotten. One who brings the light, one who revolves that. For thaka, for this individual, for thaka ma'al rasul, he will be with the Messenger of Allah as his rafiq, his companion in the in, in, in bijanani and the gardens, you know, alhamdulillah. He's going to be a companion with the Prophet Wasallam for revolving a sunnah. This is tremendous. The reward of bringing back something that was forgotten. All right? Such as marrying the widow. Marrying the widow. Marrying the divorced woman. Okay? Such as marrying the widow, marrying the divorced woman, marrying those women who normally will be single for a long time. This was the son of the Prophet that he will encourage in himself married divorced woman. He also married the woman yani, who were widow. You have to understand that there is a place for all of that. So it's a sunnah. Is it a sunnah that something, it's a sunnah from the Prophet Wasallam, right? Which is the quote for the word sunnah. There are many abandoned sunnahs of the Prophet Wasallam that have been forgotten throughout the years. Just reviving that. Alright? Also something else that shows us. Not only did you become a companion, but it shows us that during the time of corruption, we should be reviving abandoned sunnahs. Meaning we should cling firmly to the sunnah. And this goes back to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Ibn Abad ibn Right? When he says, Whoever from amongst you, from any yaishu, from whoever from amongst you live after me, min ba'di. Right? They're going to see many difference. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي So upon you is my sunnah wa sunnah al-khulafa' al-rashidina mahaleen And upon you is the rightly guided, the sunnah, the rightly guided khulafa' Right? So if you think about it, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioning these difficult times that will come after him But the remedy to get through those difficult times is holding on to his sunnah and the sunnah of the khulafa' al-rashidin Here Ibn Uqayyim is bringing this and others notice this tremendous reward That a person who revives the sunnah during the time of corruption Right? Abandoned sunnahs. It's always things to do, brothers and sisters. When the world like is going to come straight down, it's always things that you and I can do. For starters, learning. For starters, learning. Talib or ilm, it doesn't die. Talib or ilm, its time is up when you reach the grave. Alright? So seeking knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking knowledge about the deen of Islam, seeking knowledge about the Prophet sallallahu this is something that you and I should continuously strive to do. All right? There shouldn't be no time where as though we just, all right, I think I got enough. No. Seeking knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the messenger and the sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is something that you should know. It's not about learning everything all at once. It's not the way knowledge is supposed to be learned. All right? But it's about understanding and when we say understanding understanding how it's meant to be understood how it's intended to be understood and applied how it's intended to be applied the only way you can do that is going via the companions with one Allah ta'ala alayhim all right so what you need to understand is just like Aisha anha, she says uh, in that famous Atha when the man said he came to ask her to seek some ilm and she told him have you put to practice what you asked me before and he says no, she said do that first before you come back and get more So the thing is, we shouldn't busy ourselves with so much trying to accumulate, accumulate, accumulate Instead of just trying to put in practice what we already have A lot of us have a, in, uh, a amount of information that if we were to put it together It will put us here, okay But the problem is sometimes we be worrying about Okay, let me get the latest book, let me get the latest things just to be in, you know just to be in, you know, yeah, I got that, yeah, I want this, but never read the book, never studied the book, never went over the book, never even tried to put certain things in play in regards to certain issues, but yet and still you think that accumulating all of this is going to get you the knowledge, that's not how it works, and there is an Islam, knowledge is a weapon, okay, knowledge of the legislation of Allah is a weapon, because if you don't have this knowledge to know about the reward, of 50 companions, knowing about the reward of making hijra to the Prophet Sallallahu for every act of ibadah that you do, doing, you do during times of corruption. If you don't know about this reward here, reviving the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu will make you become a companion with the Prophet Sallallahu in paradise, in general, right? 
You don't know about this reward. This means you need knowledge to know about this stuff. You will actually miss out on these golden opportunities. Do you understand? This is why he mentioned this. So knowledge is real. Shaykh al he says, Anna alladhi yuhi sunnatin min sunnani rasul alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam alati matat fa innahu rafiqun nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam fa jannah. He says, so for the one who revives a sunnah, a sunnah, one who revives a sunnah from the Prophet from the sunnahs, okay? Now you have to remember, as we talked about this before, different, uh, um, the ulama, whether you're talking about Ahlul Hadith, or whether you're talking about uh, the Fuqaha, you know what I mean? Many of them have different, you know, definitions uh, that they have coined for sunnah, all right? So the people hadith, which we'll go by here, is you have to understand the sunnah cover a variety of things and it covers the statements of the prophet all right his silent taxed approvals things that were done in his presence but he did not censor it or say anything against it so it makes it permissible uh, and otherwise to do um his actions that the prophet sallallahu did actions which weren't specifically for him but the campaign i mean the ummah can actually follow him in those actions all right and there are other things Al Hadith mentioned, such as his attributes, such as the way that he walk, uh, you know, his characteristic, uh, his characteristics, his physical characteristics, and stuff like that. And here, reviving the Sunnah is something that the Prophet Sallam either did, said, or silent text will prove that might have been lost or forgotten. So if a person does that, you know the reward you get, you accompany the Prophet Sallam, you become his companion in the paradise. The Sheikh continues. Uh, Ibn Qayyim, he says, This is where we stopped at when we recited the poem on the first video. Um, he mentioned that this, all of this is also confirmed in another report that comes in at Tirmidhi, the Sunan of Tirmidhi, for the one who have two eyes. He says, Tashbihu Ummatihi, the Prophet ﷺ, he had likened his Ummah to the foam. I mean, I guess like uh, terrain, not foam, to terrain. Um, right? Awalun minhu wa akiruhu fa meaning the first of his ummah the generations of his ummah and the last of his ummah the prophet sallam has yani mushtabihani he has mixed them together yani um, in terms of liking them to liking them falidhalika la yadri and for that reason ibn qayyim said you do not know wala i mean la yadri ladhi or la yudri and he says la yadri ladhi it is not known it does not know which of from amongst them that will be specifically mentioned with virtue, okay? And those who will be raised, elevated, and weighed out, yeah, I mean, in scale. Which one is better? Shaykh Taymini comments on this. He says, He says, The Prophet ﷺ has resembled or likened his ummah to the rain, whereby the first of it is not known from the last of it. You're not able to differentiate the first from the last and then the hadith is stated from the hadith of Anish where he says the Prophet said the likeness or the example of my ummah is the example of rain. You do not know, it is not known whether it's not known whether the first of it is better or the last of it okay so this is the hadith that he's referring to talking about whether or not known which one is first or better those who came before or those who came later all right the prophet was selling like in his own those who came before those who came later this is a tremendous uh actual um hadith all right shaykh al-dameni continues he says because they they are they are like they are resemblance meaning the first of the ummah and the last of it so pay attention what's taking place here. So the first of the generations, they had the virtue of what? What did they have? They had the virtue of proceeding. Okay? They proceeded. They do it first and foremost, right? The first earlier generation, they proceeded. They had virtue. They spread the sharia of Allah as a wajah. Right? It's for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last of the ummah 
those who carry this particular burden. Well, I'm not calling the burden, but those who carry the mantle of this deen, right? Uh, during the times of corruption. So each one of them, the first earlier generations and the last, each one from amongst them have taken a portion of preserving this sharia. Alright? For this reason is not known يعني, the first from the last. Because each one took on the mantle. So it's not known which one from the first from the last. So Ibn Al-Qaim, he continues, and we're getting ready to stop inshallah after we do a little bit of uh, this section here. He says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَى أَثَرٌ بِأَنَّ الْفَضْلَ فِي الطَّرَفَيْنِ أَعْنِي أَوَّلًا وَالثَّانِي وَالْوَصْتُ ذُو ذَبَجٍ فَأَعْوَجُ هَكَذَا جَاءَ الْحَدِيثُ وَلَيْسَ ذَا نُقْرَانِي وَلَقَدْ أَتَى فِي الْوَحْيِ مِصْدَاقٌ لَهُ فِي الثُلَّتَيْنِ وَذَاكَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ أَهْلُ الْيَمِينِ فَثُلَّةٌ مَعَ مِثْلِهَا وَالسَّابِكُونَ أَقَلُّ فِي الْحُسْبَانِ مَا ذَاكَ إِلَّا أَن نَتَابِعَهُمْ الْغُرْبَاءُ لَيْسَتْ غُرْبَةَ الْأَوْطَانِ لَكِنَّهَا وَاللَّهِ غُرْبَةُ قَائِمٍ بِالدِّينِ بَيْنَ أَسَاكِرِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَلِذَا كَشَبَّهَهُمْ بِهِمْ مَتْبُوعُهُمْ فِي الْغُرْبَتَيْنِ وَذَاكَ ذُو تِبْيَانِ So he says in his line of poetry, he says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَى أَثَرُ And indeed, a athar, alright, and we need to understand that athar can be a hadith, or an athar can be a statement uh, that's applied to the companions, the tabi'een, or the atba'a tabi'een, right, which is also known as the athar. He says, so in the athar have come regarding the virtue of these two groups, meaning the first and the last, all right, of the ummah. A'ani awwalin wathani, that's what he says. What I mean by this is the first and the last, because he just talked about that. He says, al-tarafani ya'ni tarafatu ummah, all right, the two sides of the ummah, Shaykh Uthameen says. Ata he says that it already comes in um, authentic reports concerning the virtue of the first of the ummah and the last of it. As far as the virtue pertaining to the earlier generations, and this is something that is clear. Why? Right? Because they already preceded us. They already fought in jihad. They already clarified the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they also transmitted it and carried it to the ummah. As for the last of the ummah, then from an ajali man yahsalu fi akirihim and a fitum with Allah. Alright? Then for the purpose of that which is attained from the last of them, that which they have um, experienced of fitna, people going away from the sunnah, people going away from the deen, people distorting the sunnah, people distorting the deen, people doing things which are averse to what is to be good, opposed to what's to be good. There are those individuals. He says, Wa yakuna sabiru ala hadil fitum. So the person who ex exhibits patience during these times of great trials and tribulations and misguidance and aversions and distortions, people coming up with all types of stuff now. You can talk to your average day Muslim. They sound just like a um, a Western. And I don't like you just the term of Western because you know, I'm raising the West, West too. But you don't have to adopt the ideology of West. And, and I'm not saying in terms of East versus West. I'm not saying in terms of that. I'm just talking about in terms of opposed to your deen. You don't have to adopt that. Even though you've been raised that way. And it's, it, it's a shame because when you be talking to a lot of Muslims, they be all over the place. Nothing is seen as if they firmly rooted in their belief. It's as if their belief took a, you know, it's separate. It's like, okay, my belief is over here. I believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. I believe in the Messenger of Allah but I, I, I believe there's a limit where that belief goes at. Whether it affects how I supposed to act, how it affects how I supposed to think, what it affects I supposed to believe in, it affects how I supposed to behave. You know, I limit that. And I'm like, well, what book are you reading? All right? Because the Quran actually tells us that the belief is a part of everything. Do you understand? So, you get what I'm saying? Allah Jalla made that specifically clear. There's no getting around that. Allah made that the decision is His, and that you have to move according to His straight line. So, how do you separate that? Well, one thing I can think of, if you look at the times, and even going back, and it's not a historical lesson, but just go back. When did they separate church from state? All right, what was that whole argument about? 
Why did they not want the church to be involved in that? What did they feel the church was actually doing? We want to remove from that. So what came about when we separated church from state? Right? What come about about that understanding? No more divine presidents moving. So now we have secular and ethics. Right? Arguments that goes on in political fronts, right? Platforms. Right? People argue about secular and ethics. Right? Morality, ethics, what you believe, etc. 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 Okay, you entitled to have that. But secular is this, this is what we want to focus on, whether it deals with the economy, whether it deals with capitalism, whether it deals with materialism, whether it deals with socialism, whether it deals with all of these different things, we have a right to actually do that, and we should separate them. But in Islam, that's not how you're supposed to behave. The deen is a way of life. It's a part of everything you do, from your decision, from your thinking process, from the way you behave, everything you do, the deen plays a part of it. And if you separate it, you're doing something which is not actually um, allowed, first of all, but you're doing something that goes against what the Sunnah was actually upon. All right? You're doing something that goes against, and that's what we're dealing with this time. A lot of fitting, brothers and sisters. A lot of fitting, right? On all levels. You know, individual come up to you and tell you, yeah, I think it's okay that we, you know, and you have Muslims going crazy about the pro-choice and pro-life and arguing about these arguments, the role versus Wade, and every single thing that's going on in the world that, you know, that happens. You have Muslims comes in, and you hear Muslims when they talk, right? And you be thinking, like, well, what is I'm listening to? Who is I'm listening to, right? It's not, what do the book and the Sunnah say about any of these things? How do the book and the Sunnah goes about dealing with any of these issues? That's not on the Muslim's mind. Ah, you, you stuck back in the, you know, you're back in the, you, you know, back then. This is not 1,400 years ago. Get with the modern times. Part of the modern times. That's fitting now. For someone to dismiss the authority of both the Quran and Sunnah because of a time period, that's not fitting now. Huh? Not alone, we won't go into the hookum of that. But to dismiss the authority of the Quran and the Sunnah, right, based on a time period, right, because you restricted it once. You said that, in other words, the Quran and the Sunnah was applicable back then. Now it's not. We're in the modern day age, so we have to focus on things which relative to us. But if the principle hold that the Quran and Sunnah is suitable for every time and place, which I believe it does hold, you know, right, that's a principle. It is suitable for every time and place. And if it hadn't, and if that wasn't the case that it wasn't suited for every time and place, then Allah Jalla would have lied. And this is kufr to say, right? To believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have lied, or the Prophet would have lied, which is also another kufr thing to think about, to deny that. Because the Prophet said, I leave you with two things, that if you hold firmly to it, you will never go astray. So if he said he's going to leave us with the Quran and the Sunnah, that means that for every time and place, these two things will still be the thing that will guide you, right? No matter what time period you're in or what not. So when you be dismissive and you say, okay, we don't have to consult with the sun. We don't have to consult with the book. That's what you're doing. You're being dismissive. We're going to come up with ways that are relative to us. That's fitting them, man. Wallahi, tallahi, wallahi, that's fitting them. And that's the time that we find ourselves living in. Anyone getting up there, they're having a beard, right? And they're talking about issues which the Quran has already dealt with. Whether there's different aspects of shirk and not understanding the roots of shirk. Whether there's actually different aspects of aiding and supporting those who are calling to shirk, those who are supporting shirk, whether it's going side by side with them, whether it's moving along in their political arenas, not understanding how that's supposed to work. Even though we have fatawas from different ulama who talks about the permissibility of utilizing some of the systems, and when you are done, um, when you are the minority and a predominantly kufar system. But that still have to have its limitations. They still have to have wisdom. They still have things have to be done. Because these people are cunning. You understand? These people are extremely cunning. They already know, okay, you want this to be done for you, and that to be done for you. Okay, then you support the LGBT. That's what you do. All right? We got to support them first. Everything that we want support first, then we will look at you guys a little bit later. We'll pass something for you guys later. But support them. Now, that conflicts with the very constitution of the Quran. You see? Do you hear where that conflict comes at? And you be like, no, I have a fatwa though. I have a fatwa here that I can work with. You know, I can work with in these political systems. I can work. I, here's my fatwa. That fatwa doesn't trump the Quran. Okay? The fatwa does not trump the Quran. Okay? All right? And the scholar who gave the fatwa 
If he's correct, he's going to get two rewards. If he's incorrect, he's going to get what? One reward. But that fatwa does not trump the Quran nor the Sunnah. All right, Allah Jalla wa Allah has made things impermissible. There is never going to be a time where it becomes permissible. Do you understand? Under no guise of circumstances. Newsflash, e-import, is it permissible in necessity? No. For those who think that e-import is permissible, no. It's not permissible during the times of necessity. Allah has made a concession that you only eat enough of it so you don't starve. If you find yourself in a situation where there isn't nothing else you can eat, then the concession is made. But it is not considered to be halal. You don't say that the pork has now been made halal. That's not what you say. All right? No, it's a concession that's been made. You're on the brink of death. You're on the brink of starving. You need something to eat. So a concession has been made. It's the only thing that you can have. Same thing in terms of alcohol. Right? And things of different things that you have. There are concessions within the Quran and the Sunnah. Doesn't make those things permissible. Alright? The Quran and the Sunnah still have to trump these things. This is whom Ibn Al-Qayyim is talking to. The people who hold on to the Quran and Sunnah during times of fitna. Alright? These are the people who hold on to the Quran and Sunnah. If the Prophet said it's black, then it's black. If the Messenger of Allah said it's white, then it's white. If Allah said it's black, then it's black. It's black. You understand? We don't go and say, no, it's red. No, it's black. No, it's pink. No, it's black. Do you understand? Because Allah Jalla said it's black. The, uh, you know, the Sunnah said it's black. That's how you approach this thing. Think Quran, think Sunnah. Implement Quran, implement Sunnah. That's how you work. You know, that's the scary part. That's the trial. That's the test that we all got. How firmly we can hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah no matter what goes on around in our lives. And if we can hold on it firmly, some of us going to hold on to 100%, some of us going to hold on to 80%, some of us going to hold on to 70%, some of us going to do 45%, some of us going to do 25%. Each one of us will be rewarded in according to what? The percentage of what we hold on and cling firm to from the Quran and the Sunnah. Don't you understand? Don't ever let the world get too advanced. I don't care in technology, I don't care whatever they get advanced to that you think that the Quran and the Sunnah no longer apply. What are y'all doing? That's a fitna. You understand? So this is the time you find the people living in. They have a majora, they have a reward, the Sheikh said. And one of the rewards we, uh, it's already preceded that they get the reward of 50 of the companions of the Prophet. He says, يعني, He talked about the middle. Okay, so now Ibn al Qayyim is getting ready to go eloquently and letting us know that there are three groups. All right, based on the Quran. All right, Allah talks about Ashab al Yameen, Allah talks about the Sabi Kun, those are four first and foremost. Those who are the companions of the right hand. Then Allah talk about those who are the companions of the left hand. Right? I mean, Allah talks about the righteous. So he, he Allah categorized the people of paradise into three groups. Alright? So Ibn Al-Qayyim is in the middle. He says, indeed there comes in the revelation that which confirms fi in these three. And also that which comes in the Quran. He says, Yashiru ila kulihi ta'ala. Shaykh Uthameen says, what he's alluding to here is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi surah tawaqi'ah. Wa sabikun as sabikun. Ula'ika muqarrabun. Allah says, and those who first and foremost indeed, uh, um, um, these are the ones who will be brought near to Allah. Fi jannatin, fi jannatin na'im. In gardens of the light. Thulusatun mina awwaleen. One third of them will be from the earlier generations. And a few of them will be from the later bad generations. Do you see that? Those who are first and foremost, a lot of one third of them is going to be from the earlier generations. The few of them, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a lot from the later bad generations. We're in the latter generations, by the way. It's not going to be a lot of the sabi kum. Okay? It's not going to be a lot of the sabi kum. He says, Wa asihu tafsarin fiha anna marada bidalika hadi ummah. He says, from the most sound, Shaykh al Thameen says, of the explanation, the tafsir of these verses is concerning that what's intended by that is this ummah, the ummah of Muhammad. He says, so the sabiqun, those who first and foremost from the ummah, right, will be one third from the earlier, be many. And as for the latter generation, then it will be few. Wa'afhabu yameen. And the companions of the right hand, those who receive their book in the right hand, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make He says, they will have one third, uh, one third of them will be from the earlier generations, and one third of them will be from the latter generations. Okay, 
He says, يعني أنهم كثير من هؤلاء وهؤلاء Meaning that they will be a lot from the first and the last Okay, I'm sure you mentioned هم ورتبت أصحاب يمين عقال من ورتبت السابقين And the level of the people who companions on the right hand who will receive their book in the right hand their level is lesser than the level of the sabikun because you know that's the highest level right that's why we will be a few from the latter generations but their level is the second level so it'll be lesser than that in degree than the first level he says let's check we have there's no doubt concerning that and it's funny because when i was reading this when you go back to the surah you do see how Allah Jalla mentioned the rewards for the Sabi Kun, all right? Those were first and foremost. Those were the highest level. And then you look at how Allah lists the rewards for Ashabu Yameen, right? Notice how Allah Jalla differentiates the rewards. And this is what Ibn, this is what Shaykh is saying here. He says this is something, you, you can see the rewards which Allah has mentioned, right? Is lesser than what the rewards Allah says about the Sabi Kun. He said, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for, uh, for us and for you that he make us from the Sabiqin Amin. So Ibn Al-Qayyim continues, he says that the companions of the Amin, they will be one third along with the, their likes. And the Sabiqin will be lesser than that. Fil Husbani. Ahlu Yameen, Yahal Allah Azza wa Jalla Fihim. And then uh, uh, Shaykh Tameen, he mentions the verses pertaining to Ashab al Yameen, Ma Ashab al Yameen. Uh, the companions of the right hand, what will make you know the companions of the right hand? And then he mentioned the rewards Allah says that will be for them. He says, as for the Sabi Kun, Allah Jalla says concerning them, Tundatatun mina awwaleen, which is the point here, wa qalilun mina aqareen, one third will be from the earlier generations and few will be from the less. He says, wa idha jama'ana hatayna ayatayn, ba'aduhuma ila ba'adin, tabayna anna awwala umma aftala min aqiriya. Pay attention to what he's saying. Wa anna aqiriya aftala min wasatiha. So listen, he says, so if we were to gather these verses, right? Hataini, these verses. We are to gather these two verses, right? Then, when we look at that, we will see one from another that the first and the early of the generations, they are better than the last. That's no doubt. You can see that because the Sabi Kun precedes Ashabi Yameen. Remember, Shaykh Yameen is going off the opinion that what? The tafsir of these verses is that what is being talked about is the Ummah of Muhammad. So the earlier generations of, of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, from the Sabi Kun will be one third. And the latter generations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will be a few of them. But that first group is better than the last. That's what he's saying. All right? He said they're more virtuous than the last. And that the last is more virtuous than the middle. Okay? The last is more virtuous than the middle. And Allah Ta'ala fi qala ashabi yami. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says concerning about the companions of the Yameen, it will be one third of them from the earlier generations of Muhammad and one third from the latter generations. It's the same. So Allah is going to take one third from the earlier and one third from the latter. All right? There's no differentiation between here like the first one. The Sabi Kun will be one third in the, from the earlier, but only be a little few in the last. He says, Wallahi, we need to understand this. Everybody runs around, you know, we want accolades and things like that. Yeah, we the Guraba. Right? Do you understand what that that term mean? Guraba, right? Okay, so Guraba is the plural for the word Garibun. For female, Garibatun. All right? Linguistically, it's a stranger. Okay? The definition of a stranger. Anyone who is not a resident. Anyone who is not from this place. Okay? Right? That person could be a passerby, so forth. The Prophet Sallam tells us in the famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Right? He says what? Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib. Right? Abira. Abira sabil. Right? The Prophet Sallam said, be in this world as if you were a gharib, a stranger, or a passerby, or a trap. Right? So, even so, a ghuraba is the pro of the word gharib. Right? مَا ذَاكَ إِلَّا أَن تَابِعَهُمْ هُمَ غُرَبَاءُ لَيْسَتْ غُرَبَةُ أَوْطَانِ Ibn Al-Qayyim is going to explain to us that the, the ghuraba, the strangeness that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about in this hadith is not what you and I think. All right? What does it mean? He says, Shaykh Al-Qayyim says, for ghuraba, the strangeness is not the strangeness of a country. Like you're out of place. You're in a country that isn't your hometown. You're in an area that isn't your place. That's not the strangeness that he's talking about in this hadith. 
the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Shaykh Abdul says, well, I can't have what to deen. The strangest he's talking about is the strangest within your deen. He's going to explain this. This is more stern and severe than the strangeness of a country. He says, He says, because if the case that a person has strangers within a country, for example, it is possible that that strangeness can be removed. How can it be removed? Whenever it can, you know, happiness can occur, pleasure can occur, whenever the person is, what, um, felt his brothers or, you know, his companions, whenever that can happen, that strangeness within that country or so forth like that, that can be removed. That's possible through multiple things. However, to deen hiyabala, the strangeness of the deen is a trial. It is something that is in need of patience. All right? For example, the Muslims can't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if they are instructed to. For example, the Muslims have to deal with laws that are being passed, which um, actually harms them and their children. All right? The Muslims have to deal with certain things which go against the Sharia, clear and outright, such as its homosexuality, as if they have to be accepted. It's being shoved down their face. Do you understand? They can't speak out against it what their dean tells them to do. They cannot remove themselves from it or anything because they don't have self-dignity. The Muslims have to um, accept being a minority in the land of the Kufar. That they have to go into a bathroom where we now accommodate transgender. So they accommodate this person or that person. The Muslims have to be bombarded with a lot of different things that they have to fight on. It's the strangeness within their deen. Their deen still need to be intact. They can't lose their deen because the, the dunya would ate them. You understand? They can't lose the deen because the dunya went this way or the dunya went that way. They have to be strong because this is a bala. It's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims who can't wear niqab, the females who for years, even in France, when they went through, they went through being persecuted because they couldn't wear the niqab. And we have females over here who argue whether or not they want to wear the niqab or not. Things which are being taken for granted by some Muslims are not the same in other countries for other Muslims. Being persecuted on a high level being tested within your deen. Do you understand what that means? To be tested within your deen? Do you understand what that means? To be tested within your deen, right? How many of us will forsake Islam based on being tested in the deen, right? Being tested in the deen, telling you, okay, because you're Muslim, you can't get certain privileges. How many people will actually forsake Islam just to get those certain privileges, right? Think about it. This is what we're saying, all right? You have to ask yourself, how firm is your... And the only way you're going to be solid, first of all, is from Allah Jalla Two, you have to have a strong belief. If you don't have knowledge of your belief, you're not going to be strong. I don't care who you are. You can, you're deluded. You're, you're delusion. You have to have a strong belief. Do you understand? Somebody telling you, look, you're not going to get this, get this, unless you give up that, that, that. Right? And they might not say it in that way. So they might be a little bit, you know, persuasive and cunning with it. So they tell you that, yeah, this is how you help your fellow man. By accepting that anyone can exploit their sexuality. That people have a difference within their identity. You understand that if they want to be identified as this, that's okay. Alright? And to be a good fellow human being, you should support this. If you don't support this, then you're not, you're not having self-respect for your fellow human beings. Right? And the words sound all flowery and everything like that. But you got to read right between the lines. Does Islam sanction this or does not sanction this? Alright? You have to be able to understand that. And what happened is, they said, okay, we're going to give you certain things. You're going to get this, you can get that, you can get that. And what you're going to have people doing, as Malcolm X used to like to say, what people drinking from what? People who don't have sense to pass up the coffee, right? They don't have sense to pass it up. It's diluted, they, they water it down, they don't have sense to pass it up. No, but you should have sense enough to know that the Quran and the Sunnah is what we go by. But if you're not strong in your knowledge of Quran and Sunnah, you're not strong in your implementation, your, I mean your belief of Quran and Sunnah, you're going to go for the privileges. You're going to go for the different things. This is the Gorbatu Deen. This is the test. During this time, you have to be patient. The people of Kahaf, they retreated. I'm not telling everybody to retreat. That's not what we're saying. But they retreated because they was living in a society where everyone was going against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted. They retreated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to die. I mean, not die, caused them to sleep. For a certain amount of years, for over a hundred something years, three hundred something years, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala brought them back to that same town, 
and their bodies and everything was still intact. This is one of the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls that being a miracle. So, Shirah Dimini says, لَكِنَّهَا وَاللَّهُ غُرْبَةُ قَائِمُ بِالدِّينَ بَيْنَ أَسَاكِرِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَهَذِي غُرْبَةُ الدِّينَ بِأَنْ يَكُنَ الْإِنسَانَ فِي وَاسِتِ مُجْتَمِعِ بَعِيدٍ عَنِ الدِّينَ He says, this غُرْبَةُ this strangeness within the deen, a person's deen, and yakuna insana fi wastin mushtam, that a person can be right in the middle, he can live right in the the heart, right? In the middle of society, but be further, ba'id in an deen, further from his deen. But yakuna I mean, be further by way of his deen. So, in other words, you can live in a society, you can live in a community, but because you hold on to the principles and the tenets of your deen, you are a stranger to them. You're furthest away from them. Even though you live amongst them, you're still considered to be a stranger from them. You understand? Oh, this person's a square. This person don't want to do nothing good. This person seems to be that, that, that. You're getting a taste of what it took for the prophets and the messengers to even call their people. Let alone trying to call your family. I'm talking about someone you are with, right? This can be your wife. This can be your husband, right? Someone you're with. Your children, anything like that. You're with them. Trying to call them to Islam is, is already one level of opposition you see. Trying to call your kith, your mother, your father, your, you know what I mean, your aunts, your cousins, to Islam, you felt you feel that. Imagine trying to call the whole society that you live in to Islam, right? Imagine how people would be towards you, what people would say, what people would do. You understand? Imagine that. Now, these men had to go out, call their people to Islam. Nuh, alayhi salam, how am I going to 950 years. He said, I called them openly. I called them privately. I called them in secret. I called them in the daytime. I called them audibly. You know what I mean? I mentioned this. I mentioned that. And they still disbelieved them. They, said. they made fun of them. They mocked them. They made it so as though their kids would see this about them. All of these different things. Right? Imagine the opposition that you would have to face just practicing this land. And you know what I'm talking about. Right? Coming around your grandparents. You got a new cob on or something like that. They're going to look like you're crazy. They might not say it right off the bat, but it's going to be there. Some people, parents go so far as saying, well, I don't know who you are. You ain't the child that I raised, right? And some of these are the oppositions that you're going to have to face being tested within your deen. But you have to hold on. That's why these rewards are being mentioned. You have to understand that. You have to hold on to your deen. Do you understand? You lose your deen as though as a rat. That's the people don't understand. You're not on this dunya so that you can get the best out of the dunya. I mean, Allah didn't place you here to get the best out of the dunya. That's never, first of all, you never was put here for that. I know we, we think that because we caught up and get distracted, but that's not what you're put here for, right? You have to hold on to your deen until you get to the true place, until you get to that abode, until you get to the rewarding place. You have to hold on to your deen. But once you lose that, you got no more playing ground. Your leverage is gone. You understand? All right? A part of losing that is losing your iman. And we need to understand the severeness, the seriousness of what's being taken from you. All right, so think about that. When you're being tested with your deen, the best remedy you can do, the best remedy you can do is sabr. You have to have patience. You have to bite down on the addu alayha bin nawaji. Bite down on what your molity. The Prophet some described that and gave that description so that you know that you can't let it go. You got to hold on to it. Don't lift up one moment because this is what you have to do. The Shaykh, he says, here he mentions, he says, uh, في الحديث أن غرباءهم على دين يصلحون إذا فسد الناس. He says, indeed, there comes in the hadith that the غرباء, the Prophet ﷺ said, they are the ones who correct, who rectify what the people have corrupted. They are the ones who correct and rectify what the people have corrupted. The people are saying, no, you can be whatever gender you want to be. No, they come in and say, no, you're only two genders, a male and a female. The people say, no. You can do whatever you want to do in terms of this. Alcohol is permissible. They say no. Alcohol isn't permissible. It's harmful. They say people say no. You can eat the pork. Is this is it? No. They say the pork is it's, it's not. It's, it's not. It's not good for you. The Lord has sanctioned. They are the ones who are correcting what the people are corrupting. Do you understand? They are correcting what the people are corrupting. The law says this. The Prophet said this in the Hadith. The Ghuraba that the Prophet is talking about. They are the ones who rectify and correct what the people have corrupted. Meaning they command the good and forbid the evil. Meaning that they command the good and forbid the evil. Meaning that they command the good and forbid the evil with themselves, with their family, with their friends, with their neighbors, with their society. They command the good and forbid the evil. These are those individuals. 
fil ghurbatayn wa dhaka du tibyan so ibn qayyim he says uh, for for this reason uh shabbahum shabbahum allah i mean the prophet sallallahu alaihi resembled them from amongst the matbu'uhum as their followers fi ghurbatayn meaning he says ya'ni matbu'uhum the one that they follow meaning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam يعني أنهم غرباء بين أساكر الشيطان كما شبه النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام. He says meaning that these individuals who follow the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم then they are the غرباء بين أساكر الشيطان just as the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has likened them when he says بدء الإسلام غريب Islam have started off as something strange وسيعود كما بدء قريبا and it should return back to being strange as it began. It should return back as it began strange. فَتُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَاءِ So Tuba for the Ghuraba. This hadith is collected by At-Tirmidhi. Even a Ghuraba to the first Islam, a Ghuraba to the first Islam, for the first Islam, Ghuraba to the first Islam, Ghuraba to the first Islam. That's what Ibn Uqayyim is saying when he says, فِي غُرَبَتَيْنِ When he says, in the two strangeness. He's talking about the Ghuraba during the earlier of Islam. The beginning of the earlier Islam, and then the Ghuraba strangeness within the latter that we are witnessing now. And the strangeness is so deep is that you're not only a gari to the society you live in, but you also strange to the Muslims you are part of. And then those Muslims who are here to the Quran and the Sunnah, Allah Fahma Salaf, is strange to the rest of the Muslims. You see? Each person becomes more strange to the other party. When each person go out of their way to hold firmly to the Quran and the Sunnah. So how firm you hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah is how strange you're going to appear to the other party that isn't doing that. Alright? If you're saying, okay, no, the Prophet was I'm, I'm just trying to give you an example here. Abdullah bin Umar used to go down a certain place. He would urinate in a certain place. He would do a certain thing only because the Prophet Muhammad did that. If you were like that in your adherence to the Quran and the Sunnah, you did that just like that, right? How strange would you be to other Muslims? People who say they this and they say that. You'll be strange to them. Why? Because you're going out of your way to hold firmly to the Quran and the Sunnah when they're not doing that. You understand? They might even charge you with being extremism. They might charge you to be a fool. They might say that you don't understand Islam. You might not be this. You might not be that. You understand? You're going to appear strange to these people. That's where you're going to appear because that's not the norm. Okay, come on. Calm down. Make a little salah here. Alhamdulillah. That's good. You're trying to put us to shame over here. Just chill out. And, and, and you understand that this is what you get because we're human beings. We don't want to see nobody outshining us or outdoing us, right? So at the end of the day, we might see somebody doing something, got something to say about it, right? Ibn Qayyim himself used to be censored from amongst his peers, from a lot of the scholars, on the way that he prayed. Ibn Qayyim used to pray extremely long. So some of, the, some of his peers from amongst the scholars, they used to criticize him for his praying extremely long. But if you understand in the text, if you understand what the possible something is saying about prayer and things like that, you want to try to get close as you can. And some of us is going to excel others in the way that we adhere to certain things. It's just going to happen. I'm sitting here giving you this talk, and there's other people who may be listening way better than me. When it comes to adhering to things that Islam actually permits, they're way better than me. You understand? And that's going to happen. You understand? You don't have to believe that just because Allah gave you one thing, that you have to have everything. No. There are certain people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given more guidance, more faith. The Prophet said that. He made it clear. He says, perhaps, Naddara, first of all, said, Naddara Allahu wajahu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten the face of the person. Ida samiya maqalati, who hears my speech. He hears my hadith, right? And he narrates it the way that he hears it. And then the Prophet said, Rubama, perhaps the one whom he carried this information to is Afqahu minhu. Is more have more thick, more understanding of my speech than the person who carries it, which separates now. The one who carries the hadith may not be more knowledgeable than the one he transmitted the hadith to. The person he transmitted the hadith might have more understanding of the person who carries the hadith. So we have to understand there are different levels. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be from the Ghuraba, I mean. And when we say Ghuraba, those who correct, um, those who correct what the people have corrupt. As the Prophet Muhammad told us in the hadith, those who correct what the people have corrupt. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be from that. Whatever we said that was incorrect. I see myself and the shaitan. I think I pretty much uh, finished this. I go to bed for the I just want to go to bed for the hour. I mean, pretty much. Um, yeah, last but not least, I got to finish just this segment. This segment right here, my father.
because he says here, he says, he says that the Gorba and the second, meaning us, the latter generations, are not like the Gorba, the strangeness in the first, meaning the early generations from every angle. They're not all the same from every angle. And he says, then look at his explanation of the zaman, meaning those who revive his sunnah in every time, meaning the Prophet ﷺ have explained that the Gorba, those who revive his sunnah from the people of innovation or those who establish his obedience from the people of corruption, I mean of, of sin. He says, He says, um, the Gharif, this shit to me now comment on this line of poetry. He says that the stranger is well known and is taken from the Gurabat. Well he Allah Yakuna Lil Sanam and Yushabihu Fi Mushtabi. And he he says that whereas that he's not like Allah Yakuna Lil Sana will not be for a person that he resembles that which uh goes on or take place within his society. Whatever we said that was incorrect for myself, whatever we said is correct from Allah Jalla Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from behind the Ashwala and just like to do it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.